I never thought my life would unravel because of a post-it note. It was just a yellow square stuck to my computer monitor one Tuesday morning with a hastily scrawled message, emergency board meeting, 2 p.m. E plus R only. My name is Marley, and until that moment, I thought I had everything figured out. Fifteen years of climbing the corporate ladder at Maxwell Motors had earned me the sales director position, and six months ago, I'd married Ethan. My department's rising star. At 39, I finally felt like I was living the life I'd worked so hard to build. I peeled off the note, frowning at the E plus R part. E could only be Ethan, and R was definitely Richard, our CEO. But why would my husband and my boss need an emergency meeting without me? Morning, boss lady. Emily poked her head into my office, coffee in hand. You look like you've seen a ghost. I quickly crumpled the note. Just tired. How was your weekend? She launched into a story about her latest dating disaster, but my mind was elsewhere. Last night, Ethan had been unusually quiet during dinner, absorbed in his phone. When I'd asked about work, he'd given me vague answers before heading to bed early. Marley? Are you even listening? Sorry, M. I've got this massive presentation tomorrow, and my brain is. I gestured vaguely at the stack of papers on my desk. No worries. Oh, by the way, did you hear about the restructuring rumors? My head snapped up. What rumors? Just whispers in accounting. Something about major changes coming to senior management. Emily shrugged. Probably nothing. But it wasn't nothing. Not with that note, not with Ethan's behavior, and definitely not with the way Richard had been avoiding our weekly meetings lately. I spent the morning pretending to work while watching the clock crawl toward 2 p.m. At 1.45, I made my way to the executive bathroom on the top floor, the one with the perfect view of the boardroom entrance. Right on schedule, Ethan arrived first, looking sharp in the navy suit I'd helped him pick out last month. He checked his reflection in the hallway mirror, adjusting his tie with trembling hands. Five minutes later, Richard appeared, greeting Ethan with a warmth I'd never seen him show anyone before. They disappeared into the boardroom, and I waited, my heart pounding. Through the frosted glass, I could make out their silhouettes. What started as a formal meeting posture gradually shifted to something more relaxed, almost celebratory. At one point, I swear I saw them shake hands. My phone buzzed, a text from Ethan, working late tonight. Don't wait up. The same message he'd sent three times last week. I headed back to my office, my mind racing. On my desk, a photo caught my Ethan and me at our wedding, his boyish grin beaming at the camera while I gazed at him adoringly. I remembered my mother's words that day, are you sure about this, honey? The age gap. I dismissed her concerns. After all, age was just a number, and Ethan was different. Mature. Loyal. Opening my laptop, I pulled up the company's internal messaging system. A few clicks, and I was in Ethan's calendar, a perk of being his direct supervisor that he probably forgot about. There it was, a recurring meeting marked only as Project Phoenix, scheduled every Tuesday at 2 p.m. for the past month. My phone buzzed again. This time, it was Richard, need to reschedule our weekly. Swamped with new initiatives. We'll have my assistant contact you. I stared at the message, a cold realization settling in my stomach. In 15 years, Richard had never missed our weekly meeting. Not once. Something was happening, something that involved my husband and my boss, and somehow, I was being left out of the loop. The question was, why? I picked up the wedding photo and studied Ethan's face, wondering if I'd ever really known him at all. That night, I sat in our dark kitchen until 11.30 p.m., nursing a glass of wine and staring at our joint banking app. The screen's blue glow felt harsh against my tired eyes, but I couldn't look away from the numbers that didn't add up. $50,000. Gone. The transaction had posted three days ago, while I was at a sales conference in Chicago. 
The description simply read, Wire Transfer, Investment Opportunity. The front door clicked open, and I heard Ethan's familiar footsteps in the hallway. He was humming, actually humming, as he dropped his keys in the bowl by the door. Babe? He called out. Why are you sitting in the dark? I didn't answer, just took another sip of wine as he rounded the corner. He stopped short when he saw me, his silhouette framed in the doorway. Even in the darkness, I could smell unfamiliar cologne clinging to his suit jacket. Long day at the office? I asked, keeping my voice neutral. Yeah, you know how it is. That new electric vehicle launch is keeping everyone busy. He moved to the fridge, pulling out leftover pasta. You should have texted. I would have picked up dinner. I was a bit distracted. I turned my phone screen toward him, trying to figure out where fifty grand of our money went. The container of pasta slipped from his hands, clattering on the counter. Oh, that. I was going to tell you about it this weekend. This weekend? I stood up, my chair scraping against the floor. You took fifty thousand dollars from our joint account and you are going to wait until the weekend to mention it? He raised his hands in a placating gesture. It's not what you think. Richard connected me with this amazing investment opportunity. Private equity, pre-IPO shares. We're talking guaranteed returns of at least 30%. Richard? My voice cracked. Since when does our CEO give you investment advice? He's been mentoring me. Ethan's tone shifted, becoming defensive. You're always talking about networking and building relationships. Isn't that what I'm doing? I laughed, but there was no humor in it. Mentoring requires telling your wife about major financial decisions. It requires transparency, Ethan. Like you're transparent? He shot back. You think I don't notice how you minimize your browser whenever I walk into your office? Or how you've been having lunch with that headhunter from Toyota? The accusation caught me off guard. I had met with Sarah from Toyota, but only once, months ago. Have you been spying on me? Does it matter? He ran his hands through his hair, a gesture that used to make my heart flutter. Now it just reminded me of how young he was. Look, the investment is solid. I'll show you the paperwork tomorrow. Can we just go to bed? No. I pulled up my email on my phone. Show me now. I don't have it with me. It's at the office. In your Project Phoenix folder? His head snapped up, eyes narrowing. How do you know about that? I'm still your boss, Ethan. Or did you forget that too? The silence that followed was deafening. We stood there, separated by fifteen years of age and an ocean of unspoken words. Finally, he spoke, his voice barely above a whisper. Maybe that's the problem. He turned and walked out, leaving me alone in the dark kitchen. I heard him grab his keys and coat, then the front door slammed shut. My phone buzzed, a text from Emily, you okay? Saw the light on when I drove by. I started typing a response, then deleted it. Instead, I opened my banking app again and started the process to freeze our joint account. As I clicked through the security questions, another notification popped up, an email from Richard's assistant. Meeting requested, tomorrow, 9 a.m. Topic, organizational restructuring. My finger hovered over the accept button as I remembered the way Ethan and Richard had shaken hands in that boardroom. Whatever game they were playing, tomorrow I'd find out exactly what cards they were holding. And then I'd show them mine. I arrived at the office early, determined to get ahead of whatever Richard had planned. The security guard gave me a strange look as I badged and, probably because I was still wearing yesterday's clothes after spending the night documenting every suspicious interaction between Ethan and Richard over the past six months. The elevator dinged at my floor, and I nearly collided with Emily coming around the corner. Marley! Thank God you're here. 
She grabbed my arm, pulling me toward the break room. Have you seen the email? What email? She thrust her phone at me. The subject line made my stomach drop, organizational announcement, effective immediately. Before I could read further, Richard's voice boomed from the conference room. Marley! Just the person I needed to see. Emily squeezed my hand. Good luck, she whispered, but her expression said something else entirely. Richard was standing at the head of the conference table, Ethan seated to his right. My husband wouldn't meet my eyes. Close the door, would you? Richard's smile didn't reach his eyes. We have some exciting changes to discuss. I remained standing. Is that what we're calling it now? Changes? Now, Marley, let's keep this professional. Richard gestured to a chair. Your contributions to Maxwell Motors have been invaluable, which is why we're offering you this opportunity. Opportunity? I laughed. Is that what you called it when you convinced my husband to empty our joint account? Ethan's head snapped up. That's not fair. The investment. Was there ever an investment, Ethan? Or was that just part of the plan? Richard cleared his throat. The plan, Marley, is to modernize our sales approach. The board feels we need fresh perspectives, younger energy. Ethan has shown remarkable initiative with Project Phoenix. Project Phoenix? I pulled out my phone, opening the documents I'd gathered overnight. You mean the restructuring plan that eliminates my position and creates a new one for Ethan? The one you've been working on for months behind my back? The color drained from Ethan's face. How did you? I'm not finished. I turned to Richard. Did you really think I wouldn't notice the private meetings? The sudden mentorship? The way you've been grooming my husband to replace me? Richard's smile faltered. You're emotional. Perhaps we should. I'm emotional? You're damn right, I'm emotional. I slapped a stack of papers on the table. These are copies of every email, every calendar invite, every suspicious transaction from the past six months. Including the ones about the board's concerns over having a married couple in leadership positions. Ethan stood up. Marley, please. This isn't what you think. Then what is it? Because from where I'm standing, my husband and my boss conspired to push me out of the job I've spent 15 years building. We were going to offer you a lateral move, Richard interjected. A new division, equal pay. In Singapore. I finished for him. Yeah, I saw that too. Convenient way to get rid of me without actually firing me. The silence that followed was deafening. Ethan reached for my hand, but I pulled away. Don't. My voice cracked. Just. Don't. What do you want? Richard asked quietly. I looked between them, Richard, with his carefully constructed facade of concern, and Ethan, my husband of six months. Looking younger and more lost than ever. I want what's mine. I pulled out one final document. My lawyer will be in touch about the rest. Lawyer? Ethan's voice was barely a whisper. Did you really think I'd just roll over and accept this? That I'd take some consolation prize and leave quietly? I turned to Richard. You taught me better than that. I walked to the door, then paused. Oh, and Ethan? I froze the account. Good luck with your investment opportunity. As I walked through the office, heads turned to watch me pass. The organizational announcement email had clearly made the rounds. But instead of shame, I felt lighter with each step. My phone buzzed, a text from my mother, coming over with wine and takeout. No arguments. I smiled, thinking of the manila envelope in my desk drawer filled with evidence of corporate espionage and financial manipulation. Tomorrow, I'd start fighting back. But tonight, I'd let myself grieve for the life I thought I had, 
and the husband I never really knew. My mother's idea of comfort food was always pizza and red wine, served with a healthy side of brutal honesty. As we sat in my living room that night, surrounded by case files and legal documents, she didn't disappoint. I told you he was too young. She topped off my glass. Men in their twenties don't know who they are yet, let alone what they want. Mom, please. I rubbed my temples. I don't need I told you so right now. What you need is a shark of a lawyer. She picked up one of the documents, squinting at Richard's signature. And maybe a background check on this investment scheme of theirs. My phone buzzed, another text from Ethan, can we talk? Please? I can explain everything. I switched it to silent and tossed it aside, but not before my mother caught the look on my face. He's still trying to contact you? Hourly. I took a long sip of wine. Emily says he spent the afternoon in Richard's office after I left. Probably planning their next move. The doorbell rang, making us both jump. Through the peephole, I saw Emily shifting nervously on my front step. Marley? She burst in as soon as I opened the door. You need to see this. She thrust a USB drive at me. I was backing up the sales reports when I found these files. They're encrypted, but the file names. She glanced at my mother. Maybe we should talk privately? Anything you need to say, you can say in front of her. Emily nodded, pulling out her laptop. These are from Project Phoenix. The investment? It's not just about pushing you out. They're planning to sell the company's electric vehicle patents to a Chinese manufacturer. My stomach dropped. That's impossible. Those patents are worth billions. Exactly. Emily pulled up a spreadsheet. And guess who's set to receive a massive consulting fee when the deal closes? The numbers on the screen made my head spin. Next to Ethan's name was a figure that explained exactly why he'd been so eager to access our joint account. He needed seed money, I whispered. To buy his way into the deal. There's more. Emily's voice cracked. Richard's been cooking the books for months, making the EV division look less profitable than it is. Once the patents are sold, the stock will tank. I finished. And they'll blame it on my department's performance. My mother stood up, reaching for her phone. I'm calling Jerry. He handled your father's corporate law cases for years. Wait. I grabbed her arm. If we expose this now, the whole company could collapse. Thousands of people would lose their jobs. And if you don't? Emily asked. They'll destroy your career and walk away millionaires. My phone lit up again, this time with an email from Richard, meeting tomorrow, 8 a.m. Severance package discussion. Legal team will be present. They're moving fast, my mother observed. They must know something's wrong. I stared at the USB drive in my hand, thinking about all the people who'd trusted me over the years, my team, our suppliers. The families who depended on Maxwell Motors for their livelihoods. Emily, can you get me copies of everything? Especially anything with signatures or timestamps. She nodded. Already done. But what are you going to do? I walked to my home office and pulled out a business card I'd been holding onto for months. Sarah from Toyota had been persistent about wanting to meet again. I'm going to make a phone call, I said, returning to the living room. And then I'm going to need both of you to help me plan something. What exactly, my mother asked, though her slight smile suggested she already knew. If they want to play chess, let's play. I picked up my phone. But first, we need to position our pieces. Emily leaned forward. What do you need from me? Everything you can find on Richard's previous dealings. And. I hesitated, fighting back the pain in my chest. Anything about when Ethan first started working with him. 
As I dialed Sarah's number, I caught my reflection in the window, tired eyes, but a determined set to my jaw. Ethan and Richard thought they were playing a simple game of corporate takeover. They were about to learn it was something else entirely. The morning of my severance meeting, I arrived at Maxwell Motors two hours early. The parking garage was nearly empty, except for one other car, Ethan's. My stomach clenched at the sight of it, remembering how we used to carpool together, planning our future over coffee and morning traffic. I found him in our, my, office, rifling through my desk drawers. Looking for something specific? He jumped, scattering papers across the floor. Marley! I was just... going through my personal files at six in the morning? His face flushed. Richard asked me to gather some sales reports. From my locked bottom drawer? I leaned against the doorframe. The one with my private documents? He straightened, and for a moment, I saw a flash of the man I'd fallen in love with, uncertain, vulnerable. Then his expression hardened. You're making this harder than it needs to be. He stepped toward me. If you'd just sign the severance agreement. Like I signed our marriage license? The words came out sharper than I intended. Tell me, was that part of the plan too? Don't. His voice cracked. Don't question that. What we had was real. Was it? I moved to my desk, noting which drawers he'd already searched. Because from where I'm standing, it looks like you married your way into a promotion. My phone buzzed, a text from Emily, Sarah from Toyota confirmed. Everything's ready. I loved you, Ethan said quietly. I still do. I looked up, meeting his eyes. Then why are you helping Richard sell out the company? His face went pale. How did you? Know about the patent sale? I pulled out my laptop. Or about the cooked books. Or maybe you're wondering how I know about the offshore accounts Richard set up for your consulting fees? You don't understand. He ran his hands through his hair, that familiar gesture that used to make my heart flutter. Richard said this was the only way to save the company. The EV division is bleeding money. Because he made it look that way. I turned the laptop toward him, showing the real numbers Emily had uncovered. He's been manipulating the books for months, and you helped him do it. Ethan stared at the screen, his hands trembling. If this gets out... Everyone loses their jobs? Their pensions? Their futures? I stood up. Yeah, I've been thinking about that too. The sound of elevator doors opening echoed down the hall. Footsteps approached, multiple sets. That'll be Richard with the lawyers. Ethan moved toward the door. Please, Marley. Just take the deal. Walk away. I thought about the USB drive in my bag, about Sarah's promise to protect Maxwell's workers in any acquisition. About the evidence already safely delivered to the SEC. You know what's funny? I said, making him pause. I actually came here this morning planning to give you a chance to explain. To tell me it was all a mistake. The footsteps grew closer. But watching you go through my desk, looking for evidence I might have against you? I shook my head. That told me everything I needed to know. Richard appeared in the doorway, flanked by two lawyers. His confident smile faltered when he saw Ethan. Marley, he began, I see you're early. Actually, I cut him off, I was just leaving. I gathered my things, including the family photo I'd kept on my desk. But don't worry. You'll be hearing from me soon. As I walked past them, Ethan caught my arm. What are you going to do? I looked at his hand on my arm, then up at his face, young, scared, and suddenly very aware that he might have backed the wrong horse. What you taught me to do, I said quietly. Look out for myself. I pulled away and headed for the elevator, my heels clicking against the marble floor. Behind me, I heard Richard's sharp whisper, what did you tell her? 
but I was already gone, my finger pressing the lobby button as my other hand reached for my phone to call Sarah. It was time to show them exactly what happened when you underestimated the woman you were trying to replace. The boardroom felt colder than I remembered. Maybe it was the early morning air. Or maybe it was the way Richard's smile didn't quite reach his eyes as he watched me settle into my seat across from him. I have to admit, he said, I didn't expect you back so soon. Three days had passed since I'd walked out of my severance meeting. Three days of sleepless nights and endless phone calls, building my case piece by piece. I thought we should discuss Project Phoenix properly. I placed a thick folder on the table. The real version, not the fairy tale you've been selling to the board. His smile tightened. Careful, Marley. Accusations like that are backed up by evidence. I slid the folder toward him. Every doctored financial report. Every secret meeting with the Chinese buyers. Every offshore transaction. He didn't open the folder. Does Ethan know you're here? Ethan's busy moving his things out of my house. My voice didn't shake, and I was proud of that. But I'm sure he'll be interested in the SEC's findings. The SEC? Richard laughed, but I caught the flutter of panic in his eyes. You're bluffing. My phone buzzed, a text from Emily, they're here. Actually, I stood up and walked to the window, they're in the lobby right now along with Sarah Chin, Toyota's head of acquisitions. Richard's chair scraped against the floor as he stood. You went to our competitors? I went to someone who'd protect our workers. I turned to face him. Someone who'd keep the EV division intact, maintain the pensions, preserve the jobs. You naive little, he caught himself, smoothing his tie. You have no idea what you've done. I know exactly what I've done. I moved toward the door. I've saved this company from you. The door burst open. Ethan stood there, pale and breathless. They're coming up. FBI, SEC, everyone. Richard's face darkened. You knew about this? I tried to stop her. Ethan's eyes met mine, pleading. Marley, please. We can fix this. Fix what? I asked quietly. The fraud? The theft? Or our marriage? The elevator dinged down the hall. Footsteps approached. Last chance, Richard said, his voice low and dangerous. Walk away now, we'll make sure you're taken care of. Fight this, and you'll never work in this industry again. For a moment, I wavered. Fifteen years of my life in this building. Six months of marriage to a man I thought I knew. Everything I'd built, everything I'd believed in, balanced on this moment. Then I remembered the look on Ethan's face as he searched my office, desperate to destroy evidence of his own betrayal. You know what's funny? I said, as the footsteps grew closer. You both thought this was about revenge about getting even. The door opened again. Men in suits filled the doorway, badges glinting. But it was never about that. I picked up my folder. It was about doing what's right. Richard Hale? One of the agents stepped forward. We need you to come with us. As they led Richard away, Ethan grabbed my arm. What about me? I looked at his hand on my arm, then up at his face. He looked so young suddenly, so lost. That depends, I said, pulling away. On how much you tell them about your role in all this. Marley, wait. But I was already walking away, past the agents, past the gathering crowd of employees, straight to where Sarachin waited by the elevators. Ready? she asked. I nodded, even as my stomach churned. Behind me, I could hear the chaos erupting, phones ringing, people shouting, the sound of careers imploding. My phone buzzed one last time, a message from my mother, you okay? I wasn't. Not really. 
In one morning, I destroyed my marriage, blown up my career, and turned my entire industry upside down. I had no idea what came next. But as the elevator doors closed on the only workplace I'd ever known, I realized something. Sometimes doing the right thing feels exactly like losing everything. And sometimes, that's exactly what it takes to find yourself again. Two weeks after the FBI raid at Maxwell Motors, I found myself staring at two pink lines on a pregnancy test in my mother's bathroom. The irony of the moment wasn't lost on me, creating new life just as I'd destroyed everything familiar about my own. My phone buzzed on the counter, Ethan's lawyer, again. I ignored it, like I'd ignored the dozen other calls this week. Marley? My mother's voice came through the door. Sarah Chin is here. I stuffed the test into my pocket, splashed water on my face, and stepped out to face my new reality. Sarah sat in our living room, surrounded by acquisition documents and employee files. The board approved the deal, she said without preamble. We're keeping 95% of the workforce. And the other 5%? Richard's inner circle. She paused. Including Ethan. My hand instinctively moved to my pocket, where the test felt like it was burning a hole through my clothes. The doorbell rang. Emily burst in before my mother could answer it. Turn on the news, she gasped. Now. Richard's face filled the screen, standing outside the federal courthouse. Allegations are completely false. This witch hunt was orchestrated by a disgruntled employee who couldn't handle being replaced by her more qualified husband. That son of a, my mother started, but I held up my hand. Because there, behind Richard, was Ethan. And he was walking toward the microphones. No, I whispered. Don't. But he did. I want to set the record straight, he said, his voice shaking. About everything. The room went silent. Sarah reached for her phone, probably calling her legal team. Emily gripped my hand. Richard Hale didn't mastermind the fraud at Maxwell Motors, Ethan continued. I did. The reporters erupted. Richard's face went pale. I manipulated the books. I arranged the patent sale. I used my relationship with Marley Anderson to gain access to confidential information. He looked directly into the camera and I felt his gaze pierce through the screen. I betrayed the only person who ever truly believed in me, and I did it because I was afraid of living in her shadow. Turn it off, I said, but nobody moved. But Marley, he continued, if you're watching this, there's one thing Richard was right about. I never deserved your position. His voice cracked. Or your love. The press conference devolved into chaos. Richard was being pulled away by his lawyers, reporters shouting questions, but Ethan just stood there, looking lost. My phone buzzed again, not his lawyer this time, but Ethan himself, I know you'll never forgive me. But I couldn't let you take the fall for exposing the truth. The FBI has my full confession. The test in my pocket felt heavier than ever. Well, Sarah said quietly, this changes things. How so? My mother asked. Public confession means faster acquisition approval. Less scrutiny of the remaining employees. She looked at me. And a clear path for you to join Toyota's executive team if you're still interested. I pulled out the pregnancy test and set it on the coffee table. Emily gasped. My mother covered her mouth. I am, I said, meeting Sarah's surprised gaze but we'll need to discuss maternity leave. My phone buzzed one final time, I know I have no right to ask, but can we talk? Just once? I looked around the room, at Sarah, who offered me a future, at Emily, who helped me expose the truth, at my mother, who never doubted me. Then down at my phone, where Ethan's message waited for an answer. You don't owe him anything, my mother said softly. But that wasn't quite true. I owed him the chance to know about his child. I owed myself the chance to understand why. 
and maybe, I owed us both the opportunity to find a way forward that didn't require forgiveness or forgetting, just acceptance of what was. And what could never be again. Actually, I said, picking up my phone, I think I do. Because sometimes the hardest part of revenge isn't executing it, it's knowing when to let it go. Six months later, I sat in my new office at Toyota's headquarters, watching the autumn leaves dance past my window. My hand rested on my growing belly as I reviewed the latest sales projections, numbers that actually made sense, untainted by fraud or manipulation. A knock at my door pulled me from my thoughts. Emily stood there, still wearing her Maxwell Motors employee badge. The verdict's in, she said quietly. I nodded, already knowing what she'd say. I'd chosen not to attend the sentencing, despite the prosecutor's request for my testimony. Richard got 12 years. She perched on the edge of my desk. Ethan got 18 months, reduced for cooperation. And the restitution? Full repayment to the company pension fund. She smiled. Your evidence made that possible. I opened my drawer, pulling out an envelope I'd been carrying for weeks. Inside was a letter Ethan had written the night before he confessed, delivered by his lawyer after the trial. You haven't read it? Emily asked. Not yet. I turned the envelope over in my hands. Waiting for the right moment, I guess. And now? The baby kicked, as if answering for me. I broke the seal and unfolded the paper, recognizing Ethan's hurried handwriting. Marley. By the time you read this, I'll have confessed everything. Not because it's right or because it fixes anything, but because it's true. And you taught me that truth matters more than pride. I didn't marry you as part of some grand scheme. I married you because you were everything I wanted to be, strong, certain, unafraid. But somewhere along the way, wanting to be like you turned into resenting that I wasn't. Richard saw that weakness in me and used it. But the choice to betray you was mine alone. I'm not asking for forgiveness. I'm not even asking to be part of our child's life, yes, I knew before the confession. I saw the test in your trash the morning I moved out. What I'm asking is that someday, when our child is old enough to understand, you'll tell them that their father finally learned what real strength looks like. I learned it from you. Ethan. Emily squeezed my hand as I folded the letter. You okay? Actually, yes. I stood up, walking to the window. For the first time in months, I feel like I can breathe. My phone buzzed, a reminder for my next appointment. Not with lawyers or investigators this time, but with my doctor. Today, I'd find out if I was having a boy or a girl. Want company? Emily asked. I shook my head. I think I need to do this one alone. As I gathered my things, my eyes fell on the family photo I'd taken from my old office. I'd kept it all these months, tucked away in my drawer. Now, looking at Ethan's smile, I felt something shift inside me, not forgiveness exactly, but understanding. What will you tell the baby? Emily asked softly. About everything? I placed the photo back in my drawer, but this time I didn't close it completely. The truth, I said. That sometimes the people we love make terrible choices. That strength isn't about never getting knocked down, but about how you choose to get back up. I grabbed my coat, ready to leave for my appointment. But at the door, I paused. And maybe, I added, that revenge isn't always about making someone pay. Sometimes it's about proving them wrong by becoming exactly who you were meant to be. Emily smiled. Sounds like something worth teaching. As I drove to my appointment, I thought about cycles of betrayal and redemption, of endings and beginnings. The baby kicked again, reminding me that some cycles were worth breaking, while others were just beginning. I'd wanted revenge once. Now, watching the autumn leaves swirl in my rearview mirror, I realized I'd found something better, peace. Not the kind that comes from winning or losing, but the kind that comes from knowing exactly who you are and what you stand for. 
and maybe that was the best revenge of all.